He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. If you would stand in honor of the word of the Lord, continue to lift up Vita in your prayer. God was so good. He, uh, he was with her in that surgery. They went in and repaired that aneurysm and everything went just as great as it could. And she's home. And we're so thankful and grateful to God for that. But continue to lift her up as she recovers. And we certainly miss her, but we know God has, has his hand upon her, and he's going to take care of her. Great to have you in God's house today, every one of you. So happy you're here. And I pray and I trust that you receive something from the Lord today, something that you need, and all of us have needs. And that's all you need is to have a need. And that qualifies you to have an encounter with God. And he promised that he would help you in your time of need. I want to direct your attention today to the book of Ruth, the first chapter. And I'm going to read several verses beginning with the first verse. The book of Ruth, chapter 1 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilgon, Ephrodites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The, names, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and, and Kilion died, also both of them. And the, women, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may, may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is going out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and but Ruth clave unto her. Skip down to verse 19. Let me read three more verses, 19 through 21. And the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, because the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. And I want to preach for just a moment or two from this subject. They never called her Mara. They never called her Mara. Would you put down your Bible and just lift your voice in prayer 
ask God to help us today. Thank you for the word of God. It's not bound, but it has free course today. Let it touch our hearts, encourage someone through this message and through your word. And I give you the praise, the glory, the honor in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. The book of Ruth is a beautiful story about redemption and provision. The book of R Ruth has been called by some as the greatest piece of literature ever written. Another writer called the story of Ruth the Cinderella story of the Bible. It is the story of how a pagan girl named Ruth came to be a part of the covenant people of Israel. We're told that Elimelech moves his family to a place called Moab. Moab was located just across the Jordan River east of the Promised Land. It was inhabited by pagan people who worshipped pagan gods. It is to this despised and wicked nation that this man Elimelech moves his wife Naomi and his two sons. And here we see a picture of the person who willy, willingly turns their back on the things of God and they pay an awful price for it. If this passage teaches us anything, it teaches us that living in a backslidden condition carries with it devastating consequences. But thank God repentance and restoration are always a possibility. Can you say praise the Lord? I don't care how far you go away, you can come home. Now the Bible says there was a famine in the land. And so Elimelech decides to move his family away from Jerusalem, away from Bethlehem, away from the people of God to the wicked and despised nation of Moab. They left Bethlehem, Judah, which means house of bread. And they moved to Moab, which means wash pot. Now, I don't know how long Elimelech planned to stay. Maybe just a few days, perhaps he was thinking, we'll stay here long enough for the famine to end and then we'll return home. But the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months and the months into years. Elimelech, Elimelech and Naomi's sons ended up marrying Moabite women. And then the Bible says that Elimelech died in Moab and it wasn't long after that the two sons died. Let me just pause to say this, and this is not what I'm preaching today, but I feel like I need to say it. Before you think about taking a vacation from God and from living for God and a vacation from church, you better stop and consider the cost. Because you stand to lose a whole lot in Moab. Don't even think about leaving the house of bread. Even if there is a famine, you stay there. You stick it out. You endure to the end and you hold on and you say to yourself, I will live for God no matter what. See, I, I've known a lot of people that took a vacation from church and, oh, yeah, we'll come back. And the sad thing is if you do get back and when they did come back, they lost their kids in Moab. And their kids know nothing about God and they know nothing about truth. Do not listen to the lies of the devil. Don't be deceived by the fake smiles of the backslider on Facebook as they type, I'm so happy. One young lady that was Holy Ghost filled sang in the choir, loved God, godly and holy, and, and she walked away. And she put a post on, on Facebook, uh, and she barely had anything on. And she said, oh, I'm headed to the beach. I effing love my new life. Don't you be deceived by that because when you go to Moab, you're going to lose some things that are very vital and important. Don't get sucked in by all the, oh, I'd be happy if I left the house of God. I'd be happy if I quit living for God. You will not. The way of the transgressor is hard. I know it may get difficult living for God, and there is a price to pay, but it is so much better. That's why the, the psalmist, I'd rather be, I'd rather spend one day in the house of God. Yeah. 
than a thousand elsewhere. There's always a price to pay when you leave the house of bread. You go out full, but you return empty. And so for 10 years, Naomi had been subjected to life in the country of Moab, away from the house of God, away from worship, away from the people of God. And during that time, she lost her husband and her two sons to death. She also had a daughter-in-law that returned to her family. All things considered, it left Naomi bitter and broken. And after a decade of struggle in Moab, she, she returned to Bethlehem to live out the rest of her days. However, she had little understanding of the significance of having Ruth with her. Upon entering the city of Bethlehem after 10 plus years, she is met with stares and comments about her previous experiences. Her name begins to be spoken from the lips of her past acquaintances and family. And they said, Naomi's back. Have you heard? Naomi's back. Naomi has come back. Look, it's Naomi, someone cried. Over and over as her name is spoken, Naomi rehearsed the meaning of her name in, in her mind because her name, Naomi, means good, sweet, and pleasant. And her name and its meaning haunted her far more than it brought comfort to her. Because she said, there's nothing good or sweet about my life. And finally, she stopped everybody from speaking. Many of them looked at her and they said, is this the same woman that left a few years ago? Because she had changed. And she stopped them and says, don't call me by that name anymore. With that, she imposed upon herself a new name. Call me Mara. Because I went out full and I came back empty. And the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The name Mara means bitter. She said, call me Mara. Don't call me Naomi. But you can search the story, and I did. And you will discover that she was never referred to by Mara. When people looked at her, they said, you're Naomi. We're not going to call you Mara. They never called her Mara. The people to whom she returned had lived through a famine. They had waited on the breakthrough. And they knew the provision of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those people began to continue to call her good and pleasant and sweet. She was still Naomi. She had lost a husband, but she was still Naomi. She had lost two sons, but she was still Naomi. She had lost a, a, a one of her daughter-in-laws and all of her possessions, but she was still Naomi. She she had wrinkles on her face, but she was still Naomi. And they continue to call her things which be as though they were not. Things which, which be not as though they were. They begin to call her and continue to call her her name, Naomi. And all of this is an inspiring reminder that I have an identity that supersedes my trials in life. I am... You are who your heavenly father says you are. I am who he says I am. You're not what people say you are. You're not what the devil says you are. You're not what your circumstances say you are. You are who God says you are. Why don't you lift your hands in this house and say, thank God. I know who I am because my father told me I'm his child. Ha. God says you're the apple of his eye. You're the head, not the tail. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a child of the living God. Hallelujah. There's at least four reasons why they never called her Mara. Number one, circumstance must never, hear me, determine your identity. I'm not what I'm living through. I'm not what I've already been through. I'm reminded of the story of Rachel when she gave birth to her second son. It cost her her life. And in her hour of death as she was giving birth, she named him Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. Jacob immediately changed the name to Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. 
Because Jacob knew what it was like to have a name. A troubling name. And he knew what growing up with a name like that could do to a person. It was the father's name that would mark this child's life and his future. And listen to me today. It's the father's name on your life that matters. My people which are called by my name. Isaiah 45, 4 says, I have named you though you have not known me. You've got a name that supersedes a name that your mama and your daddy gave you. I may be ill at times, but I'm not infirm. I may be discouraged occasionally, but I am not in a state of depression. I may struggle financially at times uh, along the way, but I'm not poor. I may stumble and fall, but I'm not a failure. Listen to me. I may, I may lose on occasion, but I'm not a loser. I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. And I'm preaching to individuals in this house today that the devil would like to put labels on you. There's that drug addict. There's that alcoholic. There's that loser. There's that backslider. There's that person that can't do right. Oh, no. You're a child of God. You've been blessed by God. Highly favored by him. Don't let the devil pin a name on you because God has already named you. Somebody give God a praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second reason they never called her Mary is because they understood circumstances must never distort your view of God. What have you been through that left you with a distorted view of your heavenly father? Naomi returned to Bethlehem and she said, don't call me, Naomi. Call me Mara. Why? Because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went to, I went to Moab full. I came home empty. And it seems she's blaming God for all of her misfortunes. She's blaming God on this and blaming God on that. The Bible said in James 1.13, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God can tempt no one with evil nor does he tempt anyone come on God can't be tempted by evil and he doesn't tempt people with evil hallelujah do not allow the enemy to use your problems to leave you with a false image of God God is good I said God is good I said he's good to you I understand he doesn't wink at sin and he's a just God and he's a God of justice and yes we will reap what we sow and God does judge sin. We know that. But we also need to understand that he said, it is not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want you to consider for just a moment all that Job went through. He lost his health and he lost his wealth. And I won't go into all of that, that he suffered. But three friends of his walked up to him for three days. They couldn't say a word. They just stared at him. And then they began to accuse him and said, man, you must have done something horrible to tick God off. And they challenged his integrity. His wife comes up and says, Job, just curse God and die. Those words were spoken from a broken heart, a burdened heart, but she had a distorted view of God. Job had a different opinion. He seemed to understand this, that if, if I can curse God and die, then I can bless God and live. I said, if I can curse God and die, then if I bless God, I'm going to live. Hallelujah. My troubles in life do not alter who God is. My pain, my problems, my storms, my trials does not diminish God at, at all. Not one little bit. God is good on the best day of your life, but he is good on the worst day of your life. When all of your world falls apart and you don't even know what to do and you can't even look up and see bottom, he's still good and he's worthy of praise. you got to understand this. God is worthy to be praised at all times. 
Somebody lift your voice and give God a praise right now. Maybe you're going through things and maybe you've gone through some things. Don't let that problem diminish your view of God. He is still on the throne and he's worthy to be praised. Your circumstance must not devalue your potential. The potential in Naomi revealed is revealed in her ability to walk the difficulty of Moab and come out with Ruth by her side instead of Orpah. Orpah's name means stiff neck. Ruth's name meant beautiful. Which one came home with Naomi? It was Ruth. You can't always help finding yourself in Moab. But you determine what you walk out with. You can either walk out with bitterness or with something beautiful. Trials can make you bitter or they can make you better. And they'll usually do one of, one of the other. The choice is yours. This thing's not going to make me bitter. This thing's not going to make me angry. I'm not going to get offended at God. I'm coming out of this better. I'm coming out of this with a better understanding, with better trust, with better faith. Hallelujah. That's your choice. You can either have, uh, have uh, Ruth with you or you can have the Orpah with you. Circumstance must not destroy your destiny. Even in her old age, Naomi had a destiny to be a part of a kingdom connection she couldn't even begin to comprehend. Her destiny was to help bring Ruth into the life of Boaz. And as a result of that, they would produce a child that would be, li would be linked all the way to the throne of David. And the Messiah. Upon the birth of Obed, the neighbor women brought this child to Naomi to be its nurse. Now she was way beyond the natural ability to biologically produce the nourishment the child needed. However... When a future generation linked to a coming Messiah was laid at her breast, God resurrected a nutrition component within her body. The destiny of a church and a movement dating back to the day of Pentecost is to nurture a future generation that will welcome the soon coming king back to this world. Don't let Moab destroy your destiny. Come out of that wilderness. Come out of that dark place and refuse to allow the residue and marks of where you've been to be your identity. I may have spent a little time in Moab, but I'm not going to let that identify me. I've got destiny. You are who the Father says you are. Jacob changed the name of his newborn son from Benoni, son of my sorrow, to Benjamin, son of my right hand. Because he knew, man, he understood that a name is linked to destiny. Mother circumstance must never be allowed to tag you with a name that negatively marks your future. The Father's name on your life is the only name that matters. Come on. You're a child of God. Nick, you're not an ex-drug addict. You're a child of God. Rick, you're not an alcoholic. Shelby, you're not a former alcoholic, but you used to be. We know that. But that's not who, that's not how God identifies you. No, 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 no. Some of you today need to reclaim your identity. The thief has stolen it from you. He's an identity thief. You're not a failure just because you failed. You're not a failure just because you messed up or you stumbled. No, you're not. Get up on your feet and say, rejoice not against me. Oh, my enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. Somebody praise God with me right now. Failure's not final. I said failure's not final. Every one of us in this room have failed a time or two. And the devil would try to convince you, you can't get back up. You can't be restored. You can't come back. Yes, you can. Oh, I feel the Lord right now. Listen to his voice. In Mark 2, 5, the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son! Thy sins be forgiven you. I love that. Jesus called him son. Everybody else called him the man, 
that's sick of the palsy. They identified him by his affliction, his problem. But Jesus isn't like everybody else. He sees you as his son, his daughter. He don't see you by your problem. Well, there's old alcoholic Joe. There's old drug addict Sam. There's old, there's old, there's old divorce so and so. There's old me- adulterer and fornicator. No, no, no. That's not how God does it. You're His child. You're a son of beloved. Now are we the sons of God? Somebody ought to shout t- today because you're a child of the living God. When the prodigal son made his way home to his father's house after squandering his inheritance on what the Bible called riotous living. The father didn't reject him. He didn't deny him. He didn't even scold him. He didn't even say, look at you. I told you so. What he did say, kill the fatted calf. Go get my best robe. Put a ring on his finger. Come on, get some shoes on this boy's feet. Hey, start the celebration. We're about to have a party because my son that was lost has been found. My son has made his way back home, and I'm going to celebrate that. We call him the prodigal son, but the father said he's just my son. He's been rebellious. He squandered his money. He disgraced the family name, but he's still my boy. Oh, hallelujah. And you are still the child of the living God. You won't do enough to offend him to the point that he denies who you are. Oh, come on. If you'll return to him, his arms are wide open today and he'll receive you. And he's going to say, you're still my son. You're still my daughter. I love you with an everlasting love. My mercy endures forever. And, and I read this. I believe it was Michelle Luna that posted it. And I Man, it just thrilled me. In Joshua 2, we're introduced to Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute that sold her body for money. But you go to Matthew 1, and that same Rahab is in the lineage of the Messiah. Because God changes labels and rewrites stories. That's what he does. He can write a brand new chapter. I don't care how messed up your life has been to this point. God can pick up the pen and he can write a brand new story. Hallelujah. He can change your destiny. He can change the course of your life in a moment's time. They never called her Mara. Oh, call me Mara. I'm not Naomi anymore. I'm not that sweet woman that left here 10 years ago. Yes, you are. You're still Naomi. You've been through some stuff, but you're still Naomi. Me. We're not going to call you Mara. I believe God is looking at somebody in this house today and he's saying, I'm not going to call you what everybody else is calling you. You're not just nobody. You're somebody. And I love you. And I have my hand on you. And you are blessed. And you are highly favored. Throw your hands up in this place right now and give God a shout of praise right I'm done preaching. I feel the Holy Ghost moving on somebody in this room today that the devil has tried to steal who you are, your identity. Tried to lie to you and tell you you're you're one thing when you're something else entirely. Stand to your feet and lift your hands and your voice and praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. We like to put labels on people, but God don't do that. You're not a second class citizen in the kingdom of God because you messed up. You're still his child. You may be wayward, but you're still his child. You may have drifted, but you're still his child. You may not have been faithful like you should, but you're still his child. You love him and he loves you. So we're not going to call you Mara. We're going to call you Naomi. Hallelujah. Every eye closed in this room, I feel the Lord just talking to somebody right now. The devil is such a liar. Such a deceiver. 
please today don't let the devil try to put a name on you you're called by your father's name